Innocent Lives Foundation is an organization that I started that is made up of security professionals that want to help save children from the horrors of child abuse. We use our skills to uncover and unmask those who try to anonymously hide online while spreading, producing, and profiting from child abuse material. So uh, here we are again as uh, our monthly meetup. This is the Southwest Florida InfoSec community uh, provided by uh, myself here in Southwest Florida and out of Naples, uh, covering the counties of Southwest Florida, along with our Sarasota sisters, um, who has changed her name and I can never remember it. So we'll get back to them a different time. Just we'll use their abbreviation as SICK because they're a pretty sick organization. Anyways, so we meet the third Tuesday of the month at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. And like I said, we're located along the Southwest Florida Gulf Coast, or uh, in other words, the Paradise Coast. Uh, we're also a DEF CON group, DC 239, and we're a recognized Derby Con community group as well. We'll take a pause for a moment and show a bunch of QR codes because that's the best thing to do with a bunch of security oriented person people. So if you want to actually take your chances and hold up your phone to the screen and scan these, they should take you if they're still working. Uh, to our different websites and social media accounts, as well as take you over to the Innocent Lives Foundation, which is our favorite charity. Uh, if you don't have a charity or follow a charity, donate to a charity. We highly recommend choosing Innocent Lives Foundation for everything they do in the community uh, to protect our kids and hunt down uh, folks who are spreading the, what would you call it? Uh, help me out. I'm drawing a blank, uh, Shane. <laughs> See, Sam. Did Shane leave us? No, I'm still here. You you pulled oh, it out is. of the hat, man. You got it. Yeah, so okay. uh, we identify people who are abusing children and uh, putting that out there on the internet for uh, sale, consumption, whatever the case may be. And so our goal is to get these bad guys and gals off the streets. And CCM stands for child sexual abuse material. Just so those of you on online know, if you've never heard uh, what that actual abbreviation means, because unfortunately it's used uh, elsewhere during the month of October um, for something else. But uh, at the end of the day, Innocent Lives Foundation does, uh, like I said, great things for the community and helping parents protect their children uh, to be safe online and in real life as well. So uh, thank you so much, Shane, for everything your organization does. Again, if anybody wants to make a donation or get more involved, uh, feel free to scan that code. I'm sure Shane could show, throw up some links inside the chat as well uh, to help out. Uh, Shane, is there anything else you wanted to mention about the organization? So we do have a couple of very cool things coming up. If you happen to be a whiskey or a bourbon lover, then uh, you may be interested in two things that we have happening. Uh, the first one is a high-end opportunity. It's a $5,000 ticket, and you will be given the opportunity to help us pick our first barrel of ILF whiskey ever. And so we will be going to... Um, Old Forester in Louisville, Kentucky, meeting up there. We're going to have a uh, tour throughout uh, the facility. Then we're actually going to, there's be 10 of us total. We still have about three tickets left. We'll be able to sit down, go through the tasting, pick the barrel that's going to end up with our name on it. And then we're going to take everyone out for a very, very nice dinner. And um, so that ticket, $5, that ticket is $5,000. Yes. Yep. I don't think the wife would be <laughs> well, the good news is you can bring her because uh, we'll also be inviting uh, spouses to dinner. So uh, it's going to be very nice and high end. Like for most of us, if that's out of our wheelhouse, we do have another one. Uh, it's a virtual tasting that will be coming up on March the 27th. A $100 donation uh, will get you five one ounce samples. Buffalo Trace, Eagle Rare, E.H. Taylor, Small Batch, Blantons, and Stag Jr. And then you'll, we'll spend about, 10 of us will spend about an hour together tasting and talking um, and going through a guided tasting of that. So two very fun things 
if if that is for up uh, you know for you great and any news on isla fest for this summer we are still working uh we had a date picked out and now we're looking to possibly uh, move that out so that's is still to be announced okay and uh, hop back to the whiskey, uh, both whiskey items um, real quick. Are those uh, tax deductible? Any donation you make is tax deductible. Okay, so even so, for the event, like if uh, if Ron here uh, could pay the 5000 to go to the test, taste testing mm -hmm. and barrel picking, he could right. deduct that from his taxes, right? He could. So we would we would have to give him an estimated value and then anything over and above that then he would be able to take that off taxes. Yes, correct. Okay. Just thinking of ways that uh, he could convince the wife to let him go. You know, any just very good. So. <laughs> very good. All it's right. going to be a blast. I can promise. Sounds that like much. It. Yeah. Nice area too. So, okay. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate the news and the the couple of events coming up. And if anybody's interested in more information, just reach out to Shane in the chat and he can communicate with you there. All right, so Southwest Florida is a burgeoning ecosystem of tech user groups. Uh, these are just some of them. And their are uh, logos here of the ones that I had and can fit on this page. Uh, if you wanna know about more about the tech ecosystem, uh, most of the groups here are on Meetup and have social accounts on various social media uh, systems too. But the sampling we have here is the Southwest Florida Coders, Southwest Florida Data, uh, which actually has a meetup that just was announced coming up on the 22nd, I think. Uh, of course, there's us, Southwest Florida SEC. There's the Pie Ladies of Southwest Florida and OWASP Winita Springs. Uh, that's one that we also run and meets the first Tuesday of the first month of the quarter. So that next meetup is going to be April, whatever the first Tuesday is in April is when the, when the meetup is. Sorry, I don't have the calendar in front of me. And then we have the VR and AR uh, group, Southwest Florida. The Sarasota InfoSec community, like I said, they've changed their name, though. I just don't have an updated logo for them. The WordPress Meetup in Southwest Florida. I mean, Southwest Florida Open Source, which may be defunct at the moment. I know that they were searching for a leader, a new leader to uh, keep the group running, but I don't think they found one before uh, Meetup. the Meetup account was closed. So if you're interested in maybe running a group and really like open source, then reach out. I can put you in contact with that person. Upcoming events, uh, there's a bunch. I just posted the links here. Like I said, all of these groups are on Meetup, so it's easy enough to, to just remember it's meetup.com and whatever the group's name is to go see their events that are coming up. The only ones that are not on Meetup is ISACA South Florida. For some reason, they are just not, uh, but they do have a website. So if you go to isaca.org and look up South Florida chapter, it'll take you to their calendar. And these slides will be posted afterwards to our Slack. If you're not in our Slack yet, there is a invite in our chat and go feel free to sign up for our Slack and then you can read these slides. So here's the moment where I pause and let others take over the microphone for a little bit before we get to our speaker of the night. And we just wanna open the floor for those of you attending to tell us your needs. Are you looking for a job? Are you seeking to hire somebody? You need more resources? Uh, do you have other needs and questions that maybe we could help out with? So for now, I'm going to put myself on mute and you all can take it over. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Stefanko. I happen to work at a, a car rental company called Hertz. Um, I'm not sure if the hiring freeze is necessarily up, but they have posted quite a lot of jobs in the technology department and a uh, few in security. Uh, so if you want to be some part of the SecOps team, um, or you want to do Office 365 email security, or you want to be my director for identity access management, you can. There's a few other there's a few other jobs in there that might be intriguing. So take a look. Let me know. If you want to make money, it's good. If you want to help me make money, also great. Thank you very much, everyone. Hey, Eric. Thanks. Do you know if Hertz is, avail is open to remote workers? Because I know someone who's looking for a entry-level security analyst type role. So uh, our new CISO is open to remote work. Um, the current, how it currently is, is it's supposed to be a, a week in the office, a week out of the office, but I have not seen any of the security operations team for like two months now. <laughs> gotcha. So um, he, 
Uh, although he prefers people to be in the office for uh, he, you know, that's a that's a preference, not a uh, not a necessity. So I especially when, especially when he remotes from he works remote from Austin for like the majority of the month himself. So I think he's uh, I think you'll find that remote is probably an option. So Eric, okay. just curious, uh, how many do you have on your team? Is it like uh, 30 hertz, 60 hertz, 120 hertz? <laughs> uh, I think on, on our team, joke. It's, it's about, uh, it's about <laughs> maybe maybe five hertz. Well, it's six, and then one, one of our guys is leaving at the end of the month. So five hertz. Now, the department is, uh, is a bit bigger than that, more powerful. Thanks, Eric. All right, anybody else? Um. I am Crystal Wernicke. I'm the president of the Computer Science and Technology Club at FSW. And sorry, <laughs> computer stop. And if anybody um, is willing to provide, I guess, some guidance or um, any ideas for presentations as well that we can do with our club, that would be fantastic. Are you, are you looking any for- presentation ideas for you guys to do? Is that what you're asking for? That's yes, or, ask. or yeah. even um, doing the presentation yourself, but um, I'm not too sure. I get weird asking for these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, you well, it's okay. Cause uh, you know, one of the reasons our groups exist is to I mean, learn from each other, right? And uh, be there for the community. So whether that's our groups providing speakers for the other groups in the area, or it's being a forum for people uh, to come out and speak on a topic that they're interested in, that they uh, want to talk about maybe later at a conference so that we can be a sounding board and a safe space uh, versus being in front of 100, 500 <laughs> people, right? So um Anytime, uh, reach out to us or any of the other groups in the area. And if you've got uh, members of your club that want to give a talk on a topic and get that practice, and we can get them scheduled. Uh, if they're looking for specific topics that one of us knows enough about to talk on, uh, we'd be happy to schedule to come in too and give a talk. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Speaking of talks, shameless plug. So I'm part of Southwest Florida Coders. And I got roped into doing the presentation in April. Now I got to finish writing it. <laughs> so that's the first thing. Yeah, so I'll be doing a presentation on uh, modern and classic design patterns. I'll be doing it in JavaScript with Node uh, because security is not an option, <laughs> basically. So uh, yeah, just basically for uh, educational purposes. I'll be doing that. And you might be able to talk to some of the Southwest Florida Key. Have you been to the meeting, Crystal? Did I meet you? The name sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. Um, I used to come in, um, I guess, early 2020, and then everything fell apart. And so, um, I would say pick, Z you know, Zarella then. Yes. So maybe you can get her list of people who presented and you might be able to convince a few people to redo their presentations over for your group. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I mean, that's an idea. It might help you going. Uh, yeah. Zarella, and Zarella knows how to beg for present presenters. So she's mm -hmm. a good teacher for that too. There's, thank you. There's also some other awesome folks that all you have to do is ask and they'll help out. Uh, Shane or I can put you in touch with um, Cytesis, uh, who is awesome in the hacking community, has done DEF CON presentations and stuff like that. She is very, has a heart for education. Uh, good one to contact who uh, for an awesome one. You can just reach out to one Laura Chapel. She kind of mm -hmm. wrote the book for uh doing wireshark and also helped establish the wireshark certification but mm -hmm. she works with vint surf and nasa to do interplanetary communications and she'll probably be more than happy to do a presentation with your folks as well oh um, that would be fantastic there's just a whole bunch of folks so if you want to contact me 
uh, at some time offline. I'm more than happy to connect with you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your help. And thank you, Ron, as well. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, and Will, I mean, it's, a, it's certainly an example of, of me going out begging for speakers. I, I approached Will, and uh, <laughs> I, this is the second time he's actually come to our our group to, to do something for me. I, I owe him big time now because I, I haven't really returned the favor uh, yet. So I'm, I'm a little apprehensive about what he's going to ask me to do. <laughs> but, um, but he's right. Uh, statistics, uh, they... Uh, speak very well, have lots of interesting topics. They've been uh, here with SwiffleSec to give a presentation. They um, gave a presentation for Python or uh, PyLady Southwest Florida. I think both of those recordings are up now. I would have to go look. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm surprised, Will, you didn't volunteer Rachel the, that maybe she could talk about something. Um, she talks awesome about a lot here. of things. So. <laughs> Uh, and if, if, for those of you who don't know, Will and Rachel are the co-hosts or hosts of uh, the Coffee Table Talks every Friday on LinkedIn and YouTube at noon Eastern, I think. I, I know by my time. <laughs> 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 but yeah, and you know, it's it's been off for a couple of weeks here because there was one time when Rachel was sick and you know a couple of things. But yeah, we we try to make it weekly and. It's just a fun get together. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, informal. I mean, you can sit there. The, the, it's great fun to go listen to a topic and just you know be there for the discussion and and everybody's chatting in the chat on the side as well, going going on the side of things. And uh, too, like Will mentioned, Shane uh, Shane's here local to us. Um, about as local as you can get. I think Shane, you're in Port Charlotte. I am in Port Charlotte, yes. Yeah, yep. uh, and uh, ILF and Shane have provided us with speakers in the past uh, too, so it's a great connection. So really, uh, Will and Shane uh, have said it already, I can't say it enough, the, the industry here, um, across the board, I don't think I've run into anybody who has been um, standoffish about offering to come in to give a talk. I've had maybe two in the last almost three years now Maybe two people say, I can't do it right now, but let's talk and, and get scheduled some, something in the future. So definitely, you know, reach out to people, whether you follow them on Twitter or on LinkedIn or some other social space, um, reach out to the different groups that have been suggested. Uh, you'll find people who will be more than willing to come and talk. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. And give a last call for anybody else who has uh, any type of needs, whether it's seeking a job, needing a hire, other needs. All right, so I'll get us moving. I'll list my need real quick. I, I work for the, and Eric loves when I say this, I work for the largest medical device manufacturer in Southwest Florida. I, and <laughs> the, we're always hiring because we're always growing. Uh, we are a company that has seen uh, anywhere from 15 to 20% organic growth year over year. And that includes even during the pandemic years when elective surgeries were actually turned off or shut down. So we still managed to hit the into the tens of digits uh, for organic growth. Uh, so it's a really amazing company to work for. It's a privately held company as well. So that helps out a lot too, because then that means our owner doesn't have to answer to the board or stake, uh, our stockholders and can pretty much be very innovative and push the market forward. Uh, so this has been great. I mean, we're always hiring people in technology, uh, different technology, uh, areas. So check out our careers page at careers.rthrex.com and I'll post that in the chat here in a moment. Uh, there's something out there for just about anyone. Uh, we're always looking to hire and grow grow our IT department. So thank you very much. All right, let's skip over Will's uh, slide here for a moment because once I turn it over to Will, he gets to take over the presentation and we'll never see this slide. So I just want to take a moment before we uh, have Will take over. Uh, just to say, uh, as Southwest Florida InfoSec community, we'd really like to thank the following people on this list, uh, especially Innocent Lives Foundation here at the top of the list, uh, just for everything they do in the community uh, here in the U.S. and hopefully one day globally, um, taking on this responsibility to, to fight, um, to uncover uh, those who think that they can remain anonymous and spread child abuse material. Um, got, Shane, you guys are doing great. Uh, we'll continue to support you in any way we can. I hope thank others you. will too. Uh, we thank our speaker, uh, Will McCullen, for sharing his time and knowledge with us, especially being two, hour, 
three hours uh, behind us <laughs> and joining us uh, tonight, uh, especially I only reached out to him, I think last month or so. So uh, appreciate uh, coming forward with this presentation for us and, and what you're gonna share with us. I think it's gonna be really exciting. Uh, I hope others agree after they, what they hear what you have to say. Uh, our members, uh, without which Sipilsec and Sarasota Implisec community, I know John's probably gonna kill me when he sees this video, but I'm still gonna use that uh, name because it's just a sick name, uh, would not be successful. I am Southwest Florida community organizations that I've listed uh, previously, and those ones I haven't listed. Uh, all these organizations who selflessly operate to lift others here in the community, we're all doing this out of our pocket. Uh, we provide these meetups for free. Uh, we're, we don't charge anything to attend. Um, our speakers come in and graciously give us their time for free as well to, to present. And all this goes towards helping, like I said, lift others in the community to um, help get people interested in technology, get people out there interested in cybersecurity, uh, coding, or any other form of technology so that we can really grow the ecosystem here. And so far that's happening. Our, our, we are a, a growth area in Florida and we're hoping to uh, continue this trend. So thank you very much to everybody. Uh, okay, Will, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, you don't, nobody has to read the slide. I just threw it on here. Uh, you're gonna introduce yourself. So I don't need to read all this stuff uh, as amazing as you are um, and all this stuff that you listed here. So I appreciate that. Um, but Will is here to talk about Pima Community College's cybersecurity range and everything they're doing, uh, whether it's with the students or out in the community uh, with a portable cybersecurity range as well. I and mean, just kind of a little bit of the history of how it all came together and, and where it's going in the future, hopefully. So Will, I'm gonna turn over sharing to you. Uh, once you're done with the uh, presentation, all I ask is you turn over the sharing back to me um, because if you leave, uh, we lose everything. So something like that, I don't know. Not a problem. Okay, look, I'm getting uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah, I am working on turning it over ah, to you. Okay. <laughs> okay, sweet. Oh, and changed my view here. Ah, Zoom. Fortunately, I'm not as familiar with Zoom. So all of a sudden I lost I did a solid screen share. I lost the chat area. So um, please feel free to pipe up if you have any questions, just let me know. And uh, again, Mike, thanks for another opportunity to share. Uh, it's really cool. And um, my main interest is, is to you know share along with what we're doing here, but to hopefully that will be, um, an option that can help spur on ideas, maybe for other institutions, uh, because with higher ed, we're all very much about sharing thoughts, ideas, creativity to try to pull things together and try to hopefully help, you know, make things as good as we can make that for the students, because that's kind of what it's all about, right? And uh, Mike, just an idea, how much time do I have? What, what time do we want to go to? Uh, we have until 8.30. Um, I have four, I have 13. Is it at the top of the hour or? Uh, we are currently uh, coming on at 7.13 at the moment. So. Okay. Gotcha. Awesome. All right. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, so well, I'm Will McCullen. I'm with Pima Community College in Tucson, Arizona, where uh, we have been working really hard to try to make this sort of experiment work that, that we're kind of working on. So let me kind of give you a little bit of a background on, on what we're doing and how it came to be and why. Um, first of all, the college as a whole, and you'll probably find this across many colleges uh, across the nation have come up with the concepts of centers for excellence, where they kind of pull together all the resources, you know, especially if they're campuses that have multiple sites. Uh, here in Tucson, Pima Community College is fairly large and it has, we have multiple campuses, uh, but the campus that we're at, we have the IT center of excellence that we've been building in 
and working on. Um, I'm used to be the director of cybersecurity and networks for the college. And I worked very closely with a gentleman by the name of Chris Bonhorst, who used to be the director of technical services, which was over all the systems in the data center and that realm. <clears throat> and where some of this kind of came into being was that we would have lunches pretty regularly and we were both adjunct faculty at the college. And um, Chris was in the situation of where he was trying to hire, right? He, he needed a, an entry level uh, Linux admin coming in. And the difficulty that we had was that we couldn't really hire anyone out of higher ed. And it wasn't just us, but it tended to be the universities around because um, when you go through the standard HR elements, folks need experience where therein lies a big problem. And we looked at that and we thought, you know, we can't hire our own students. How ridiculous is that, right? We should be able to, I mean, that's what we're about. We're an education institution trying to develop up a workforce. So <clears throat> that's when we got into thinking and our, our thoughts went along the lines of, well, how do we solve this problem, right? Because how many folks, I mean, there's quite a few folks here representing business as well as education. And for us, the model was somewhat broken, right? You can take a lot of folks that throughout higher education across this nation who have learned a lot of theory, but then to take them and say, okay, could you please go set that up? Um, you run into an issue. And so we immediately started thinking that the whole concept of the education needs to be well beyond just knowledge regurgitation, which isn't doing a whole lot. Certs across the board have been uh, in our minds kind of a, um, an attempt to provide by the industry a way to say, hey, this person knows how to do X, right? And again, a large part of number of certs fall into the same category of, okay, yeah, but do you actually know how to do it? Um, so we were thinking and, and naturally what comes into mind um, amongst higher ed institutions is the whole concept of internships. Well, great. You can have students come in, but um, how many folks who've either been running a data center or anything along those lines, do you allow brand new students to come in and have administrative access? Probably not, right? We've got compliance. We have risk analysis, all that coming out of our ears. So that's not gonna happen. Um, do you allow students to come in and start working on production servers? <laughs> no. Um, so unfortunately, across this nation, there's a whole bunch of student interns doing things like installing printers or uh, cleaning up parking lots or, you know, worse, right? So that doesn't really work. So what immediately comes into play is that you need an environment, an atmosphere, where students can get hands-on action. So what that kind of entails is an enterprise class data center, <clears throat> right? And um, a lot of us in the industry know what that entails. You have everything from major networks, Cisco, Juniper, whatever, to firewalls, uh, uh, significant network segmentation, complex firewall rules, systems, stage, development, production environments in your data center, um, and also having project management, change management, risk analysis, incident response, all this starts to come into play. And it's, it's no small feat, right? So then how do we do that? Well, this is this is where we are so far. We also had this unique option 
to where there is a volunteer group in Phoenix uh, called the Arizona Cyber Warfare Range. They are now the National Cyber Warfare Foundation. And uh, they are a volunteer group of nation state level hackers. Uh, these folks work uh, quite heavily with a lot of three letter acronym organizations. <laughs> and uh, they also provide intelligence to a lot of these organizations. And uh, the founder of the range is heavily involved with a company called Tech Data, which you may or may not know. Um, it's probably one of the largest companies you've never heard of. Uh, they're the largest, nation's largest tech distributor. They are now called TD Cinex, and they're a $60 billion company. Well, um, Brett Scott uh, helped found that. And he developed this volunteer group where anyone in the community can come and learn how to hack, right? So it's his ranges are basically places where uh, he provides inter -class, enterprise class equipment in a nice safe space. So you can come and, and work on it, go for it. And his desire is to create uh, capable cyber warriors, folks that we can really put in to help save this country. Well, that, that works really well with a higher ed model. And uh, we got to become good friends and develop trust. And so we've opened up, um, we set aside a room and area where Pima provides the power, the electric, and all that for the Arizona Cyber Warfare Range. So we have the, an Arizona Cyber Warfare Range at the college where anyone in the community can come in and go to town. Well, along with that, we um, also have created a student-run data center. So we've got several racks and we've developed it into a dev stage production environment. Uh, we've got major servers running in there. Uh, we've, we have VMware clusters. We have Juniper top of rack. We have uh, Palo Alto so that uh, a large number of the students all have read access to this. Uh, we also have a cyber operations center, a uh, cybersecurity operations center, and we have a fusion center, and we're hoping to develop a hackerspace, but I'll come to that in the future here. Um, so the whole thing about this space is that it is completely cordoned off from the college, it basically air-gapped. And we have our own internet link for this center of excellence because that's the only way that you can give students full access to this. It's a non-PII zone. So we keep all personal identifiable information out of there. And that way students can have run of the data center and of the classrooms that they provide the desktop support for. They provide the solutions. They work to create the um, all the solutions that are needed in this environment. So one of the cool things along with this concept is that um, with the Arizona Cyber Warfare Range, it is a space where industry professionals want to come as well, because you know how many we, we have. Fortunately, in Tucson area, we have Raytheon heavily. Uh, we have a large uh, area with IBM and uh, a whole bunch of other small businesses and smaller groups to where it's a safe place to come and set up these hacking environments. So where a large number of folks have cyber ranges, things like, um, oh, I don't know, Cyberbit and some of these other services, they are essentially labs in a virtual environment, labs in a box, right? This is different and we call it a live fire cyber range because what it is is a large room and a data center unto itself where we've got enterprise class servers and students can come in and put it to work. We've got donated routers and things like that that students can check out and take home. And it offers a whole lot of wonderful functionality. As such, with industry professionals wanting to come down and hang out and be part of, uh, because folks like Raytheon, IBM, some of those environments, 
uh, Fort Rachuca down the, down the road, which has army intelligence, uh, they have a hard time just kind of, oh, hey, let's spring up a Kali environment. Yeah, go ahead, please. If you've got a question, just this interrupt. Just a question. So you mentioned the hardware and all that. So are all the goodies there? So I forget the name of the tools I would need to like, I want to hack the, what, some, what I would need to like hack the Wi-Fi at some company or get a new note. All the hardware and all that stuff, along with the nasty little software we might need. Oh, absolutely. We have a, a whole suite of Hack5 tools, which has a lot of fun stuff, everything from pineapple, Wi-Fi pineapples to bash bunnies to, you know, all yeah, those. Pineapple is what I was trying to think. I couldn't come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we've got the um, Alpha Networks um, USB adapters that you can do all sorts of really fun things with. Uh, we have dongles that are pulling in software defined radios. So uh, we're, <laughs> we're doing stuff like we can pick up all the electric meters and gas meters in the area and see the consumption. Uh, we can pick up, um, you know, if you, if you are comfortable with Kismet, if you've ever worked with that, you can pick up all the airplanes and uh, their information. Um, but all this becomes areas where you can start to explore. When you bring up things like Wi-Fi pineapples, we have students doing uh, evil twin attacks. If you've ever played with those, they're, they're a lot of fun to where uh, you hit the Wi-Fi and it looks like Starbucks. It, it acts like Starbucks, uh, but whatever username and password you put in there, then we can show on the big screen, right? And we can do man in the middle attacks. Pardon if me? I had my, if I had my laptop set up and I had a juiced up version of Cali on there, could I cut, bring it into the room and use it to like pretend or attack the system internally? In the room? Absolutely. And you don't really need to because all the workstations have Kali loaded on them. Uh, so um, the, it's, an environment, it's an environment where you can sit down and start to hack the neighbor across the way, right? How many times do you have the opportunity where you can come in and you can bring up like uh, HPaint? and start to flood uh, somebody across the way with, um, oh, several hundred megs worth of sin acts, you know, and, and watch that kind of, kind of pelting bring a workstation to a crawl, right? <laughs> so you have somebody across the way going, what's going on all of a sudden this isn't working? Well, how would you find out? How do you know if somebody's hacking you? What does it look like? Um, ask somebody around. Stuff up. That's what we need a bunch of these more everywhere, really. Because I was talking to Mike the other night. He says, yeah, I'm just trying to get back to where I can stand up a couple boxes here and do an isolated network so I can get frosty on a few of the toys in Cali and all that. Right. So what if you had a place where you could go down? Uh, the, the FBI who looks over my shoulder coming in and saying, hey, Ron, let's go. <laughs> right. So what if you had a place where you could go and hang out and put all those into play, right? Because the workstations are there. The network is all set up. It's a nice big lab. It's not a place you want to do your banking, but it's a fantastic place to come and explore these utilities that... If you try to use them in other places, you get put in jail, quite frankly, right? So we need this safe place, right? Because you can go to Russia, attend uh, cafes, and you can hack any one you want as long as it's not Russia. Uh, the Chinese, they, they raise hackers like our uh, baseball leagues, everything from little league all the way on up to the majors. What do we do here in the United States? Well, we put people in jail. How are we going to create an effective community if we don't create places where they can learn and grow and figure out and get uh, ethics and guidance along the way, right? Let's not kill careers before they start. Let's take these folks that have curiosity, that have passion, 
and put them on into play in an environment. Give them a place where they can grow and stretch your legs and combine notes with others, right? And from our point of view, just as you, we don't train cops with squirt guns, right? Um, we need to figure out how to do the same thing with cyber. Because if you have never spent any time hacking, if you haven't even delved into that realm, then how are you going to effectively defend, right? If, if you've never been the recipient of some of these fun and imaginative ways to attack, how do you know how to detect and, and see that it's happening? What Do you know what to look for? Have you ever been the recipient of where your machine goes catatonic and you're trying to quickly recover so that you can then figure out what's going on, let alone defend or launch something back, right? <clears throat> so we're trying to create this environment. And along with this, so the big concept here is that if you are in the data center, you can learn business best practices, how to do stuff well, um, and follow the norms. It's on that side of the college. You can see this divider here um, with the, let's see if I can get my pointer. Where is my pointer? There it is. Uh, you can see this arrow in the middle here. On this side of the college, where we have our data center, where we have those elements, business best practices, how to do things well. That's where you get your grade. That's where you do your traditional learning. On this side though, in the Arizona cyber warfare range, <clears throat> no classes are held there. That's a place where you're encouraged to come and fail, right? Hey, That's well, a place, hey, well, pardon me? Can I ask you a question? Sure. So I, I live in Hawaii and, and we're, they're building a cyber warfare division, the NSA is. They already have a thing called the Pineapple Fields. That's where Edward Snowden works. And so I went to a boot camp here. I was with half military guys and half civilian guys. And the problem like I faced is because I'm not ex-military and I don't have security clearance. So all the three letter agencies Raytheon, General Dynamics, Booz Allen, they're all here. There's like 60 different jobs here if you have clearance. The issue is how do you get clearance when you, you know, you have to have the company sponsor you. So, you know, yes, you can get trained in that, but the clearance is what you need. And it's like them, you know, they're taking a chance to give you clearance and it can take anywhere from what I think it's like three to six months that the clearance can take. And then you might not even pass the clearance. So how are you combat, combating that issue? Because I, I think they need to give somewhere down along the road because they're gonna need people to fill those positions, right? So I'm just curious because I'm really interested in your school. I could send a lot of people to the school. I get people all the time. Like I had the guy put in my, I got uh, the high fiber optic internet in my new place. And the guy was asking me because he saw my computer. He's like, what, what do you do? And I told him, and he's like, oh, I'm interested in doing that. And so yeah, I said, yeah, well, text me. So he's like texting me information. So the boot camp that I went to got sold out and it's not really that good right now, but I'm more interested in the clearance and how you combat that. I think it's great what you're doing, yeah. Um, clearance is always going to be a sticky issue in government realms. Uh, I just, there's no real way around it as such, right? Uh, now we do have quite a few vets in our community. They're real good for being able to uh, head into some of those realms. But we also have, uh, through the Arizona Cyber Warfare Range and the National Cyber Warfare Foundation and links with Tech Data, uh, they have a program um, pathway that, uh, is it pathway or passage? Uh, I forget. Um, but the, they've got a program that they've just opened up to where they'll take our students and provide extra training, everything from pen testing to uh, areas and help basically just as they are a uh, technology supplier, they can be a talent supplier after they've done some of that initial training and things along those lines. 
uh, tech data itself is a um, falls into one of those corporations that handles clearances and things along those lines so that there's possibly opportunities through there as well but um yeah uh, if you want specifically a government job specifically a military job that's a very difficult hurdle to get around and i don't have any magic pill for that uh except to increase your skills and then look for opportunities sorry i don't have anything specific in that room but for corporations and for others in the arena there's lots of opportunity to grow and that's that's a huge need that this country needs to face in a big way right we need capable people that can help defend and also how to help clean up a lot of what I kind of think of as sloppy IT, right? It, all you have to do is head out on Showdown, pick your, pick a company, pick a, pick a education institution, pick almost anyone. And it's not that hard to just find, you know, head off to air and find their uh, network block throw that net block into Showdown and then you can see servers. And the beautiful thing with Showdown is that it lists out vulnerabilities right there. You might as well have a hack me here button, right? And what that means is that folks are not doing updates. First most obvious method of protecting is by doing updates, right? So if it's not being done, Patching. Yes. So I, you know, I, I can just piggyback on that as well, too. I'm working as a SOC analyst right now. And we had a client that, you know, we got all kinds of alerts for when we went and checked. We checked everything. And when we went to Shodan, there was actually a screenshot of their login screen with the username on it. And when we reported and told them, the IT guy was telling us, because we did an MMAP scan, we realized they had they had so many ports open that it would have been considered below an easy box on hack the box. That's how many ports were open. We've never seen a scan like that. So when we told the IT guy, he was like, we told him he didn't even know how many ports there were. He didn't even know that there's 65,500 and whatever it is ports. And he was telling us we were wrong and we just kind of laughed and we said no. And then we had him have him clear. We went above him and when we did, then the guy saw, he was like, we got to close everything off. And he said, this is not good. So it's kind of, you know, and you have the on-prem stuff where everything should be moving to the cloud. You know, there's that people are stuck on those systems and stuff like that. So, you know, you run into all that. And, you know, I've come from the red team side, but I'm working the blue team, which helps me because I see certain things. I'm like, see patterns. And I'm like, this isn't good. Whereas the blue team that come from IT, they really don't see those patterns at all. Absolutely. And that that that's the epitome of why everyone in IT should have at least a little bit of opportunity to look at it from the other side, right? So that you, you, you know what occurs to you of things that you have to look out for. And we need to start thinking in our minds, IT, we need to get off our academic high horse and start to say, um, no, this is not an academic exercise. This is much more of a trade than anything else. Uh, and I forgot to put this slide in, but we have, when you walk into the range at Pima Community College, we have a great big sign on the door that says, leave your ego at the door, right? And what we present in that concept and what the culture we're trying to develop is that nobody knows it all in IT, right? And unfortunately, IT is fraught with folks that feel that they need to hold their tail higher than the other, right? Let's throw that out at the beginning. Let, let's all just acknowledge that that's just a bunch of hooey and let's focus on being peers that can work together and help each other out. So what we're trying to do at Pima Community College is blur the lines between teachers and students and start to turn it into just peers trying to help one another. 
right? And we're also looking to bring it into the K-12 space. And we work very hard with workforce. We put together a summit to where we pulled in 100 plus people uh, around Tucson businesses and said, you know what? We're a community college and this is great, but uh, we're going to take a step back. You tell us what you need to be able to hire our students and uh, have had them help to create our curriculum. And they came to consensus fairly quickly. And we had other interesting surprises come along with that. Like in our cybersecurity degree, we have a project management class. Not that the students are going to be managing projects, but the businesses said, no, no, you misunderstand. They're gonna be hitting into projects out the gate. So they need to understand the lingo of projects. They need to understand the basic concepts of project management so that they can walk in and participate. So this is our student run data center that we built up. So we have a space where we have racks um, put in, we've got the uh, equipment and then uh, we have another room off to the side so they can go in and work on the equipment where if anyone has worked in a data center, it's loud, it's cold, it's noisy, right? Um, and so if you want to be able to set up the server, then have a space to work on it, that's where we have developed this secondary space. And um, it, it is becoming more and more popular which is wonderful. So students, when they walk into this space, um, can be thrust with projects. Like um, here, you need to create a, a VMware cluster because we need that right now in stage. Uh, oh, hey, welcome. Uh, we've got another group. Um, we need a Red Hat satellite server set up so that we can interact with all those elements. Oh, hey, you know, it'd be really cool to have a Zabbix monitoring server set up. And so we'll hand that to a group of students and they'll, the first reaction is usually almost always the same, but I've never done anything like that. <laughs> Welcome to IT, right? Um, here's Google, here's some instructions, go for it. And we'll give you some basics, but as you get going, um, if you hit a brick wall, let us know and we can help you over that hurdle. But in the data center elements, and, and this also takes place in our capstone classes, but students can be doing this throughout the year. They can come down and spend time and say, here, go to it. And we get the same reaction um, almost inevitably. I've learned more in this one week than I have in semesters. Because all of a sudden, you're out of that realm where you know you take a class on Linux, then you take a class on Windows, and you take a class on Cisco. But where are the classes that say, okay, here's a Linux front end that needs to talk to a Windows database in the back end and have it go across um, networking? That's real IT. That's where you get thrust with these problems that there's no documentation really solidly for. You have to go ferret it out, figure it out, and get used to that. Well, if we can get students used to that at the get-go, um, now we're properly teaching IT in our, in our minds. Plus, when you get into that environment to where you're trying to work on something, then, it, then you get these interesting revelations that take place. It's like, oh, that's what we covered in class. Yeah. Uh, oh, if we had only known that last week. Okay. Now that we know that, let's take that and do whether it be VLANs or whether it be, um, you know, setting up databases or whether it be whatever. Now something brilliant starts to happen. And this is where it gets really exciting. Now the knowledge that they're learning in classes is no longer just knowledge that you have to check off a box in a test. Now it starts becoming tools that you need in your quiver to be able to attack a problem. And, you know, because inevitably students rebel at knowledge out of context, right? If there's no content, it's like, what? How many folks have went through calculus wondering, oh, when am I ever going to use this, right? 
If you don't have a context to place it in, then it just becomes information that you're trying to recover for some reason, right? And that's where we're trying to change some of that aspect. We also yeah, have real, real a- quick, Will. Yeah, sure. Uh, I see Shane had a, a question in chat. Um, yeah, sorry, I like, can't see my chat at the moment because I'm sharing the full screen. <laughs> yeah, that's okay, I, I got gotcha. you. Um, awesome. So any, any training on physical red teaming, social engineering and or professionalism? Uh, social engineering. Um, we are looking to try to head down that route. Uh, we are, we work in with um, the University of Arizona who uh, the U of A cast has a class with uh, Had and Aggie. So that probably what spurred on some of that. <laughs> uh, uh, but also in the range, there's elements of social engineering. Um, but we, as of yet, we don't have that, but we're going to be working to create some workshop type uh, workforce development type classes along those lines. It's when you go for an AES degree, which I can bring up at the very end, it's very hard to fit all these wonderful things that you can do in IT into two years of credits, right? So um, we have to be a little selective in how we do stuff, but there are other ways of going about that as well, whether they be workshops or whether they be um, workforce related classes or things along those lines. Um, but we're continually working on trying to grow those elements and, and, and also, uh, it's really kind of cool because Cy wants to be doing adjunct faculty for us as well. We're really excited about that. Uh, so uh, hopefully that answered the question. So then we also have a fusion area. We created this space that is a combination CSOC and fusion area where we've got a collapsible glass wall in between so that we can have operations war room, we can have defend attack, we can have operations in a class about the operations so that you can see through the glass wall and say, hey, look on screen three, let's bring that into the classroom and start to work on that. So this is our fusion area. And we call it our fusion area because we're also trying to bring in other disciplines throughout the college. Uh, we have areas where we teach law enforcement, paralegals, accountants, uh, nursing. Uh, we have robotics and applied technology elements uh, to where we'd like to at least have spiced in some of those other classes sometime here in the fusion area to where uh, we have a, with the cyber range and with elements there, we have a unique possibility to where we can uh, demonstrate how some of those attacks take place so that folks that leave our nursing program, folks that leave the law program have a, at least an idea of the concepts and how it looks. Yeah, shoot. Yeah, so I wanted to, I wanted to catch you because this is a good topic to, to take a quick pause on and ask you, you know, you, you mentioned law enforcement and, and nursing and, and the other um, careers that are that are available and maybe you have students that are moving through those paths and you want to expose them to this has there any has there been any thought or maybe you're already doing it of running actual tabletop exercises uh with yes. these students and and with the community organizations so bringing in law enforcement from outside bringing in the hospital or other healthcare uh organizers uh to have the tabletops right here and, and run them through those exercises yes and we also have some proprietary uh, access to some proprietary tabletop exercises that are used by tech data and places like that to where it becomes much more of a Dungeons and Dragons than anything else, right? So you have your group that's your C-level, your group that's your tech managers, and your group that's your uh, boots on the ground tech area. And uh, okay, let's now start to walk through a scenario. And then you get people pontificating. Maybe uh, if you bring in some business, they have their run books. And uh, then they start to talk about how they might handle or something. And then you say, oh, uh, 
you, you take out a dice and you roll it and you go, ah, okay, now this just happened. Now, what are you gonna do? And then immediately you start to recreate the fog of war scenario to where things are happening as they're talking. You can't just sit and talk about it. Um, we're in a live action situation type deal. And uh, those are highly effective and fantastic for students, especially if you can bring students in as well as companies that are trying, you know, that look for a, a inexpensive resource to be able to run through tabletop exercises and bring their run books, all of a sudden it gets very uncomfortable, right? But the students learn a ton. The students get that invaluable understanding that corporations are not these, oh, got everything together and are these entities that, you know, you go to and, uh, uh, you know, they're normal people, just, just like uh, you students. So um, welcome to the club. You have a lot to donate. You have a lot of worth to wherever you're going because it's just made up of people no matter where you go, right? Uh, so all of that comes into play. Uh, with the law enforcement areas, some things that we would really like to get going are some classes for local law enforcement on what to do when you hit a crime scene, right? There's not a whole lot of training for law enforcement of for just your general officer, you know, okay, there's an open laptop. How do you, how do you handle that? What's the first thing you do or don't do or things along those lines? What, what might be happening? happening in the background that you don't know about, right? What might be uh, just out of range, <laughs> but still taking part. Um, all these kind of things that we can hopefully give a different awareness of and ability for. Uh, so there's a whole lot of areas we can grow, but we're still getting going, right? COVID kind of brought a whole lot to a screeching halt and, and now we're trying to get those systems up and going, but it gives you an idea of uh, the avenues and the thoughts that we're trying to head down. Here is our CSOC. So our Cybersecurity Operations Center, and on the other side of that is that glass wall that I talked about. But we can take the output from the lectern of four different screens, and we can pass that to any screen we want to. Um, but the beauty of this environment, which is, uh, I'm working to get set up. I'm, I'm, Elastic has graciously provided us a uh, free license to work getting some Elastic servers put together to get our SIM running. Uh, through the National Cyber Warfare Foundation, they are also a huge ISO. So they have indicators of compromise that are international. So if you're not familiar with indicators of compromise, uh, if you have something coming against a firewall or servers that creates logs, right? Those logs then go to a device called a SIM, and uh, some call it a SIEM, um, tomato, tomato. Uh, they <laughs> and some have religious wars on that. I don't give a flip. Uh, <laughs> so it goes to this device that then does correlations. So if say you're at Pima and you log in at East Campus and West Campus and then from China, something's off, right? And so it'll draw those correlations and that something that's off becomes an indicator of compromise. Well, most institutions can only see their own indicators. The National Cyber Warfare Foundation has international feeds coming in, so they can see things coming against the military sector, the health sector, the energy sector. And uh, it is the product that Tech Data actually sells along those lines. And they are going to make this free for Pima Community College, which we're like, wow. But the advantage of that is that as students are learning how to do threat analysis in this room that you see, that's why the screens are large so that you can do comparative analysis, they'll be hopefully developing actionable intelligence that can help save elements of the nation and the communities and things like that. Because you can now not just see your own information, which you normally look at a baseline and say, 
okay, this is our normal, what stands out as abnormal, you can now start to look at correlations. So this is attacking us. How many others is, are being attacked by this? So let's, let's see what's happening and draw correlations that way, um, which is just a huge opportunity, but it again takes it out of the, uh, let's just work with a static data set to, oh, this is happening now. It's, it's important, Let's, it, it brings a whole different focus. Then Mike also mentioned our portable range, right? And uh, this is what caught his attention early on. We had a talk in, and uh, that I went into the program and then he graciously said, oh, hey, you know, why don't you come and share? And uh, I think it's awesome that you're recording this because then we can spur in ideas and then other education institutions that have ideas can, you know, we can get that conversation going and improve all around, right? That's the general idea. <laughs> uh, so what we did here is we uh, took a, a server, uh, which this is a Dell server uh, in the lower right-hand corner here that has um, about a half a terabyte of RAM and 128 cores and um, a fair amount of disk uh, in a nice cluster right there. And then we also got a whole bunch of laptops and some ruggedized cases. And on top of the um, box here is a Ubiquiti Wi-Fi device. Because we started off by going to an event. This is an event called SheTech. And when we did this pre-COVID, we took a whole bunch of laptops and it was done at IBM. IBM was the host. So we went down to their campus with a whole bunch of laptops and said, hey, we want to teach a whole bunch of girls here how to hack. Can we use your Wi-Fi? Well, the answer to that is no, if, if you're just curious. <laughs> so uh, we were like, okay, uh, let's rethink this. And that's where we came up with this idea of trying to get some ruggedized cases that we can then make this completely portable. So in this scenario, what you see here, this was uh, a while back in our, our inaugural push in, into this uh, mobile range to where uh, what they are studying here and what they're working on is the I noticed that you had a logo for OWASP. This is the OWASP juice shop where they're working through some of those scenarios where it involves, you know, getting clues off of the social media elements of the site and where it goes into basic scripting elements where they're doing SQL injections, where they're, you know, there's just a whole lot that's built into that OWASP juice shop that you can work with and run with and just have little guides. And the awesome element of it is the excitement that comes into play. Uh, Emma in the juice shop is a fictitious user that you can come in and get the clues on how to recover a password and then do that. And you can, the girls are there working at it, they're going through, and then once they recover the password, it's like, okay, Emma's account is no longer Emma's, is it? And you get this sudden momentary jump and they're like oh this is fun <laughs> and go into it and yes we do teach the uh ethics just before we go into it and the dangers that are involved but, but it then becomes hands-on real and it's something that can be used so that this range we immediately threw up a hundred virtual we have vmware running on it and we threw up a hundred instances of this uh, juice shop. But by the same token, we can take that and make entire environments inside of it. We can have, uh, um, we can assign to each laptop its own virtual, you know, with nested virtualization, its own virtual environment, its own little network, and its own separate workstations that work with that. And, and turn that into a pod and then instantly clone it, right? Um, those are some of the advantages that you can do when you have a server along those lines and can put that into play. 
Uh, you need to have enough memory. You need to have enough horsepower. And uh, then you need to have that connectivity where you can pull together to really do that well and comfortable. Plus, we can throw up targets. So the National, the Arizona Cyber Warfare Range has a whole lot of their own manufactured targets to hit, as well as capture the flags. So uh, we have going uh, maybe twice a month, capture the flags where our student clubs pull together in the range and uh, um, make that happen. Our student club uh, is on Discord and it's about, it's over 200 strong. And when they hold those events, they have a great time, right? You, you come into the range and you've got the DEF CON music going, you've got uh, Nerf guns are flying. You have in our uh, Arizona Cyber Warfare range, we also have a refrigerator, a microwave. And because it is not part of the college, it's the cyber range, it's not on the college calendar. And what that means is that as long as we have a badged volunteer in there, it can be open at three in the morning or on holidays. And that's okay. Right, and we we have that happening. We have some students that are actually there at three in the morning, and it's like, are you guys nuts? Um, sleep. It's a good thing. I know you, right? Been there, done that, and be careful, right? <laughs> Anyhow, um, these are some of the students from our student club, the off officers at that time. This is the Arizona Cyber Warfare Range. So. We've developed this environment and um, try to make it as fun and as possible. Uh, here we have some students in the range working on all sorts of different things. Uh, you can see Paul back here with a server carrying it through. Uh, and um, I forget what these women were working on at the time. Uh, here they're working on creating a walk-in ticketing system so that, you know, uh, folks can register that they were there in part of the range right there. All these different workstations all have Kali on them and uh, we're administering it with fog so that we can immediately nuke and pave those boxes when we need to, uh, full with a pixie environment taking place um, and lots of whiteboard space. And uh, back up in here, you can see the Nerf guns, um, right? It's the whole idea is to make it a place where you can go, relax, and immediately get help from each other. So somebody can go in and say, I've never installed a Windows server. Okay, park it. Here's a server in the back. Let's get that going, get you hooked up to it. Now go for it. Well, I've never done that before. Great. Have a good time. I'm going to go over and get some uh, snacks and uh, go for it. And they can just kind of hold their hand up and say, okay, what do I do now? And people will come over and start to help each other. Another very important lesson to learn that we can really use in the industry, knowledge sharing, helping each other out, getting past this whole ridiculous concept of I have to prove myself, right? Um, and because if folks can feel comfortable and safe, then creativity takes off, then diversity takes off. The one be beautiful thing of the range and the cyber environment is that it is one of the most diverse groups going as far as everybody can be strange and accepted, right? Whether you are on the spectrum and have to get the answer to this solution <laughs> to this problem or preference or background, it really doesn't matter. And the beauty is, is that folks can come in and because I, my personal view is that if everybody's focused on the problem and if everybody's focused on the technology, then a lot of the rest starts to fade and starts to disappear and everybody can just be techs and hackers working on trying to figure out how it all works. And that's a beautiful environment when that, as that takes place. Okay, Will, uh, got another um, question here in chat. 
Yeah. Uh, so Megan was wondering, do you have anyone doing documentation that's also, that's also often missing in the workplace? The beauty of that, um, you know, in the project management area that the students figured out in design, they had to go find the product they wanted to use, uh, preferably open source, and put that into play. So they set something up, they get servers going, and then the next people come in. Hmm, let's go talk to the first people. Oh, you know, the, maybe that documentation idea isn't such a bad idea, <laughs> right? And they also get to work on a survival guide. Welcome to the um, data center. Welcome to the range. What can you do? What are the possibilities? How do you do it? Uh, and a lot of part, part of that is us throwing the problem back on the students. Right to where all of a sudden concepts of project management, change management, documentation start to be, become really good ideas. Because as the environment gets more and more complex, it gets more chaotic. And so then you can say, hey, it's a good idea, right? So now let's uh, start to include everything we need, not just what scripts are needed to be used or what order it needs to be started up in. Include screenshots, be creative, do what, what you think the next completely green, completely new student is going to need when they hit this environment and be able to keep it running. And as such, when you then bring on others at the same time, um, they have a very interesting desire to give immediate feedback. <laughs> it's like, okay, now what am I supposed, how am I supposed to know what this was? Here I am, get, get, help me out, please. What was that? What, what were you thinking? <laughs> and students are really good at being quite honest with each other <laughs> and, and helping that to grow. So that it then becomes, again, a real world issue, right? It becomes something that if they are feeling the pain from it, they feel the comfort from the solution. That, and like I said, this is all a great experiment. We don't know exactly how all this is going to turn out, but we kind of guide things as best we can, uh, promote ideas that maybe they're not thinking of, so that they can take it and run with it. But the most important thing is that they feel that they have ownership of it. And not that it's structured us telling them what to do, but uh, being a resource for ideas of maybe some good ways of doing things that they didn't think about, right? But it still comes into their hands. Um, and we talked about the coffee talk. That's just a little slide for the coffee talk. All sorts of different, uh, projects and possibilities and oh if you're um i can't see the group list anywhere I, i'm really bad with names whoever is asking earlier about speakers feel free to go to youtube and look at some of the past coffee talks and you can contact rachel and she can immediately hook you up with all those different speakers easily because most these folks all came on volunteer and were willing to talk so they're, I'm sure, be more than willing to talk with your students as well. Uh, so before COVID, we had all sorts of fun events. Um, but also after COVID, just uh, this last October, we turned a coffee talk, uh, which was awesome because Rachel came to Tucson. Woo I finally got to meet her in person. It was wonderful. <laughs> but we also had Chris Roberts there. If you don't know Chris Roberts, he's quite the character. Um, he was uh, known years back for being the plane hacker because he allegedly got on a plane and allegedly, allegedly uh, hooked into the in-flight air system and allegedly sped up one of the engines, you know, to cause it to veer a little bit, which to help get and the industry's attention, and he's still walking among us today, so that kind of gives you an idea. He, he also uh, hacked the Mars rover, had it playing Freddie Mercury's God Save the Queen one morning. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. Uh, and 
all sorts of other stuff. But he came to give a talk and you can on YouTube in the coffee talk area, uh, you can watch that. It was really a cool time and where folks were expecting it to go real tech, they covered broad topics that um, were really cool. And they met it face on and honest, which was a lot of fun if you haven't seen that one. Um, so Chris Roberts came and talked, Brett Scott was there talking, and uh, Ryan Kloiter, who is doing a whole lot in the K-12 arena as well for helping to secure things. Um, and then we have all sorts of events around Tucson. This is just kind of a, a largely for the Tucson community. We have SheTech, which involves Pima, IBM, Raytheon, City of Tucson, University of Arizona. Uh, we have the Cyber Patriot program. If you're not familiar with that or in education, that's an awesome opportunity where students can come and compete nationally for scholarships. So that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and the difficulty that Cyber Patriot has across this country is that you try to do something like that in a K-12 environment. Hey, we want to have a hacking class. And uh, the typically the K-12 IT department goes, <laughs> right? And so <laughs> they're not allowed to do it. Well, here at Pimo, with the range and with those environments, we try to open it up and say, hey, come on down. And oh, by the way, there's people here that can help you. Uh, people that might give you ideas that you haven't thought about or run through capture the flags that you haven't done before. Everything with Mr. Robot to uh, BWAP, the buggy web app, to ones that they've made up, right? Um, all fantastic opportunities to grow. And uh, then we have an area called SARSF, which works heavily with the K-12 institutions. And then we constantly are giving tours and elements like that to K-12. And we won a grant. Uh, we're a Hispanic serving institution. Uh, we won a grant that will help, that has helped to beef up um, our, um, to be able to do some employment <laughs> and hire one of the folks that we're hiring is an outreach coordinator to help reach out into the local area. Because from our point of view, our one major mission, right, Pima, is to help provide opportunities for students that may not have known that those opportunities were available right, to the poor communities, to the Hispanic communities. There's uh, folks that don't know that it's not as difficult as you first imagined to have a career in cybersecurity uh, and to dispel some of those myths. And we're going to be reaching out and taking elements like the range, the mobile range, out into the K-12 communities, out into events. We can do it at Comic-Con, for goodness sake. And I, also, it's that element to get the word out there and say, hey, you know, here's some opportunities. It's, it's actually kind of fun. And also, the wonderful thing that the range provides is that, you know, I, you, how many of you have gotten the question, right? My sister's brother's parakeet's last owner's friend says there's a lot of money to be made in IT. You should go into IT, right? So, so what's that make us? <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a reference. I want to see if you, if you get it. Absolutely nothing. Uh, it's from the old Spaceballs movie, right? So. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, well the. Uh, mission to Parakeet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, These guys are old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it happens to everybody. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah. The advantage there is that students, before they spend a dime, right, we, we don't want to get students into an area, take money from them that they desperately need, only to find that that's not something that they want to do, right? Because IT is kind of a unique area, agreed? I, you, you need to love IT if you want to be in IT, because otherwise you're going to be miserable. It's a constant treadmill. It's constantly changing. It's constantly growing. And if you don't love IT, 
to be constantly studying, constantly growing and learning, uh, it's, it's not a fun place to be. So why don't you come on down to the range, actually try to work out installations or capture the flags or explore service before you spend a dime. So you can get to know, is this what you want to do or not want to do? Right. And then also, if it is what you want to do, hey, you can start to get a feel for what you're looking for. You can start to talk to people around you and find out what the different possibilities are. You can start to learn what different elements and career wise goes. Right. Um, and then our second mission is to help save this country, is to help create those cyber capable cyber warriors to make a difference, to help provide that that training league that China provides to help provide that hacking cafe that Russia provides to help build an area to where folks can actually explore safely and get to delve in deeper um, to find out so that they know how to protect this place. Right. And a large of our curriculum is, is of course, built around elements that help support um, certs, but we don't teach to the certs. We teach the concepts and the foundation elements that heavily are involved with the certs, but we don't teach to the tests, right? We teach to the concepts. And so here's uh, for all those that are still with me and maybe are not in the corner drooling at, you know, right? Um, this is the elements of our curriculum to where uh, we've aligned it to where some basics where you have the A+, plus, which we're using the Google curriculum for, um, some Windows, business communication, uh, and the very first Linux class, which is the first half of the RHCSA degree uh, cert. Uh, and we've given our own little cert certificate for it, which is a Pima certificate. But the whole concept there is that if you come in and you go through the entry level of that in that pathway, then you're at the point to where you could go and maybe be part of a geek squad or uh, be a first tech level for a K-12 school district or whatever, something where you can maybe actually get a job to help support as you continue on your targets and goals of what you wanna do. And then the next year, we start to do the same sort of thing uh, with another certificate to help boost that even a little bit. Then we get into uh, elements where we're, we have, before we go into our, our penetration testing and hacking kind of classes, law and ethics. Let's get that quite solidly before we get into the others. Um, we have SEC plus introduction to Wireshark and network analysis. That's the one I teach, which is also goes heavily into network stacks and TCP fundamentals and, and those elements. Um, and then the second half of the Linux. And then we have virtual computing and we have our capstone class, which heavily gets involved in the data center and taking on projects in groups uh, to to meet needs of the data center, to meet those in that infrastructure in the data center that we need at the time, right? Uh, so that whatever they do in that class is not just a project that will be tossed away. It's a project that is to help support the environment and will be picked up by others after, uh, which gives a, a different motivation. Uh, we also have a networking element that, that gets a little bit different, but the very first part of the curriculum is the same. So those, that first element is pretty much identical so that students, when they come in, they can start to get an idea of what technology is, what the different possibilities are so that they can change their course um, a lot earlier on. And then we also have a programming element, which is the first part into which then goes into a bachelor's degree in with the U of A. Um, so we are the first half of what's called a two plus two. We do the first two years 
and the university takes the second two years because you pretty much need a college degree in programming. Um, that has a, has a much more um, built up desire from uh, organizations to be able to put that into play. But then we also have fast track programs to where they can be accelerated learning and this can be used by industry as well. But those same classes that if you take them through the fast track element instead of the normal curriculum, it can still apply to the normal curriculum. So whatever, whatever you obtain in those elements, you can then apply into the AES degrees should you want to go on from there. So um, let's see. Uh, so it's myself, Jim Craig, and Chris Bonhorst uh, are the team that are helping make this go. And, and fortunately, this is one of these obscenely wonderful things that came together because there's no way any one of us could have really made this happen. Um, Jim Craig, uh, who has an incredible business background, uh, but he also started as a programmer at Hughes before it became Raytheon, uh, working on uh, the tow missile systems and things like that. So we have a dean that gets IT, which is just unbelievably useful. <laughs> I, I cannot understate how awesome that is. <laughs> um, but anyhow, that gives you uh, an overall idea of some of the elements that we have in play and uh, what we're trying to do, what our motivations are, where our heart lies, and uh, how it is indeed a great experiment of what we're trying to pull together. But then pull that all to where you can hack it at Pima. <laughs> so with that, uh, if anyone's still uh, conscious and aware and, and with me, <laughs> do, do you have any questions? I can stop sharing here and uh, theoretically. It's basically, uh, it's more for Mike. This vit, the recording is gonna be available if I wanted to circulate it. Uh, yeah, so we've been recording the we've been recording this, and uh, as soon as I get it saved and converted and edited, we'll chuck it up on our YouTube channel to be available. And for some reason, the stop share is not operating. They'll see your okay. presentation any longer. Yeah, it's uh, uh, you stop sharing when you said you were. You can, you can probably see my screen as I'm doing this, right? Or oh. No, don't see it at all. Nope, we don't see anything. Okay. Cool. Where's my Zoom then? <laughs> Push your mouse all the way to the top of the screen. It might be hiding up there. On one of your monitors. Uh, okay, I have a new share. Yeah, so I just stole host back from you. So maybe that'll okay, help a little cool. bit. All right. Well, if you're seeing things properly, then it may just be my client that has freaked out. So I would have to leave and come back. <laughs> but other than yeah, that, I, I, I'm running blind, so I can't see any of you now. <laughs> oh, no. But if you can hear me, that's cool. And I don't know if you can see me or not. We can. We can hear you and see you. Cool. So other than that, any questions? None for me. I thought it was an excellent presentation. I probably went through way too fast. No, but. no, I, have no a, I think you did a great job. I actually have a, a question for you in some of the courses. Um, I may have missed, I joined the second late. Um, do you guys cover any um, to topics, say like for responsible disclosure uh, specifically? So say, I think you touched on it earlier with documentation, but uh, the significance of you know uh, finding an exploit uh, with an application or something, and then being able to document step by step the like how to reproduce it. Uh, I think that that I was just curious about that. Right, and those uh, fall into um, can't remember the title, and now I can't really see it. Oh wait, let me pull back here. I can see my own presentation, which is cool. Um, 
the CIS 245 cyber analytics detection and response. So that would definitely be part of that curriculum. Very neat. No, I was just, I was just curious because I know that's something we run into a lot. Uh, if you have a disclosure program, um, oftentimes you'll get a report and either you can't reproduce it for one reason or another. And it's, you know, if people could come out of school writing up those types of reports, they're already way ahead of the game. That's yeah, awesome. I'm a large, the vast majority of our faculty are adjuncts. They're, they are professionals that are in Great. the field. And um, the gentleman who, one of the main gentlemen who teaches that class is a pen tester who lives in uh, Utah, actually. Um, and he's done a real good job of that. And we, uh, several years ago, our program, you know, before I came on board, our program really, well, it was terrible. Uh, <laughs> and so a whole lot of our program has all been completely rewritten and redone. And with the emphasis of trying to bring these pertinent elements into play. That's awesome. Sounds like you guys put in a lot of time and thought into this course. Really you covered a lot of bases. That's all. That's great. So um, remind me, what, what is that concept? I, I hear a lot of people talking about, what, what is a weekend? What? <laughs> and vacation, that's, that's a strange concept too. What, what exactly is that? <laughs> what, what a concept, right? He's foreign. What, well, what? If, uh, if you don't know what a weekend or a vacation is, it's where you take time off of work. A weekend oh. happens every, every week. <laughs> So, you know, at the beginning and end of a week, right? Those would be the weekends, right? So Sunday and Saturday. And then uh, vacation could be whenever uh, you want to. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, time you, it's time you take off work to do other work. <laughs> exactly. Or catch up. <laughs> we'll yeah, we're, we're finally getting there. Uh, okay. Thanks to this grant and being able to bring in some other positions and stuff uh, and things really getting off the ground. Uh, uh, we've been able to hire what we call data center specialists, which are uh, base level positions, but it's where the students basically have jobs to keep the place open and to help provide that structure to, uh, if somebody just walks in cold into the data center, I want to do something. Okay, here's your VM, and and you have this much time. If we don't hear from you, you know, uh, here's places that you can start. So that they're taking care of the allocations, and they're taking care of keeping the environment open, and they are building the systems to do that and the processes to do that as well and so that's taking a huge load off of us to where i think we can become real people once again which would be very very welcome will can you hear me yeah okay i had a little mic issue there so i went to the foundation while you were talking of course and uh i noticed what is it there's also a range in georgia and what wisconsin and now yeah. that's something you exported is that something you're trying to do like say, hypothetically, a university in Florida uh, or New York or whatever wanted to do this, you guys would assist or collaborate or whatever? And is that, or do you have a format already in place to roll out? Is, is that so I think that's a goal. Excellent question. Um, the cyber range is an element of the National Cyber Warfare Foundation. So that's something that would be done through Brett Scott and that organization. That being said, uh, the one that you um, see in Wisconsin, for example, that you brought up uh, is working with a group called WICTRA, uh, the uh, Wisconsin Threat Cyber Alliance or something, I, I forget. Um, but they've also partnered with the University of Oshkosh. And how we were able to help in that arena is to, uh, in a much faster time frame, help the University of Oshkosh um, get acceptance and understanding of the range because we were able to help provide a lot of the 
a lot of the potholes that we had to go through, right, and help give a framework of the risk and the threat analysis that we had to do to be able to present to administration uh, to cover some of the methods and the ways that we approached administration uh, to also cover some of the elements of how we uh, integrated with business in the local area to help provide that interest in, and some of those techniques and elements we did with meetings with the University of Oshkosh folks, uh, which they were very grateful for. <laughs> you know, uh, anytime we can help somebody from having to go through the same pain that that we went through, the better. Um, but it's a large part of it is getting the concept and the idea and approach through to administration of what it actually means, what it's going to involve, that it is going to be risky, that it is going to be disruptive and different. Um, so that's, that's how the University of Oshkosh is getting going and um, also helped them to kind of spec out uh, some of the things that they need to do to get going and approaches to take, but now they're they're very much running on their own and with the help of Wiktra. So uh, the advantage that they have there is that Wiktra represents some very passionate individuals that want to make this happen because whoever is handling the range portion of it uh, needs to be doing it with a great deal of passion. Uh, it ha it's it has to be something that you're willing to put a lot of heart, time, energy, sweat into uh, to effectively make that happen. And um, that's something that's built up with the range folks. Uh, and same thing in Georgia, they have some uh, somebody who was a trusted member of the range group who went over to Georgia and, and helped to spur that on. We are the educational side in being that tandem connection to where as far as the educational elements go and with the elements that we're doing in the Center for Excellence, we're more than willing to talk with anybody and, and share with them um, some of the um, hurdles that we've had to go through and, and hopefully help make their lives more comfortable and easier, <laughs> if, if that helps answer that question. Yeah, I did, thanks. But good question because the range is a volunteer place, right? So it's not a product that is sold. It's not just a, oh, hey, uh, we'll get this product, set up a server, and now we're ready to go. It's a lot more dynamic. It's a lot more of a culture. It's a lot more of, um, it's not well, the equipment. If I had one here, we'd have no evenings or weekends either. Pardon me? I said if. If Mike and I had one here in Florida, we'd have no nights and weekends either. Uh, yeah, 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 we'd have no, true, no weekends, no vacations, no nights. But I mean, that's something I, I, I think I mentioned to Will, I've mentioned to you now, Ron. It's, uh, I, you know, I'd really like, and then one of the reasons, the selfish reason, reason really of having Will here is like, this is something I feel like we need here in Southwest Florida. I, we're lacking it. Um, there's other areas in Florida that have something similar. I haven't seen anything that's free and open to the public. Uh, Tampa has a, a cyber range, but you have to pay membership dues to, to access it. And there's the Fly Florida cyber range, but I don't know. It's one of those things we have to take the reins down here because everybody forgets Southwest Florida exists and uh, build it up. Well, you have a huge background with B-sides, right? And so it's very much the same, same culture and approach, but then what you also need to do is develop your, um, your business community and by pulling them together, and this is where we did this with a summit, right? And, and repeatedly going after this approach of pulling business together and saying, hey, uh, correct us if our, if we're wrong, but we think a community college should be something that helps empower people to then get hired and meet your needs. So if that's the case, wouldn't it be a really great idea to be part of it? 
Uh, wouldn't it be a really great idea that if we can keep a close connection with industry, our advisory board. So we have an advisory board that has representatives from a whole lot of businesses around Tucson. And uh, we pull together on a, on a regular basis, like every couple or three months. And it's, uh, this is where we're at. This is our heart. This is what we're trying to do. Now you tell us what you need. Um, you tell us uh, what you practically need out of this. Let's, let's not just sugarcoat things and go through typical boring meetings. It, this needs to be practical. We, we need to know what your pain points are. We need to know what you're experiencing with new hires. We need to, uh, your input, uh, and if, if you have that input and if you feel strongly and you have that need as a business, um, maybe you could consider, oh, I don't know, uh, being part of adjunct faculty or part of helping to develop. Let's sit down and, and work on these elements so that we, we've got to reinvent to some degree a lot of this academic environment and turned it into a business academic collaboration. Uh, and the only way that works is if businesses really get a feel that you're serious about it. Uh, you can't do it halfway. And you have to, um, you have to slough off a lot of that can, sort of academic culture. For those that are in the academia, uh, they know exactly what I'm talking about, but um, it's a lot of work, folks, uh, and you have to have a passion for it, and you have to, you have to really want to make it happen. It, it can't just be a job. It has to be a passion, and it has to be something that you recognize that you want to fix and that you want to make happen. And if, if that, that's in your heart and you believe that and you're willing to put that work into it, they perceive that fairly quickly. And I think that has probably been the biggest element that makes a difference, if that helps anyone out there. Yeah, definitely. It can't just be an educational institution. You, you've got to connect. You've got to be part of the solution, which means that you have to know the problem. I completely agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but then good luck trying to um, convince some of your administrators or or fellow educators, right? Uh, that's that's where it, it becomes a bit of a challenge at times. Yeah, but I'm quite persistent. Awesome. I'll keep on doing it. Even after I graduate, I'll just be like, hey, did you do this yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, find some folks that uh, in industry that you can talk to and help spread the vision of what you're trying to do, and then take them along with you to talk to those administrators. Some, a lot of times in academia, and it's just like, really, um, a lot of times in academia, the folks that are doing the job are not as trusted as the outside voice. Hence, why we hire consultants all over the place to tell us stuff that everybody on the boots level already knows, right? <laughs> oh, wait, we see that in the private space as well. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but um, so if you can get some champions on your side to help turn it into a cause, and it, it's a, you have to make that vision simple. You have to make that vision practical and then really push the practical. Any other thoughts, questions? None from me. Where can we improve? What are we doing wrong? Well, I don't think you're doing anything wrong. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's always something we're doing wrong. <laughs> yeah, but we don't get to play in your range to find out. <laughs> yeah, do, you, do, you have a, do you have a VPN we can connect in? Ah, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> the uh where we still have some development in the range area that we're working on for that uh and part of that is just getting the internet connections right and that kind of stuff but the system is set up 
to where uh, hopefully we can grow that much more into an outside element as well that can then have ways and means to actually connect in inside. So, you know, that does start sound humorous at the start, but that is part in the idea of bringing that into play. Uh, and that offers all sorts of possibilities. Because remember, it's a toxic environment, right? So if somebody comes in and tries to hack in, and well, now we've got a project, right? Um, if some skullduggery is taking place through that, well, that can be focused on and um, worked on and also provide all sorts of wonderful intelligence. Why not? <laughs> Which is kind of a different way of, of looking at it. <laughs> Sound good? Sounds great. Thanks for thanks so much for your time tonight, uh, Will, and coming in and sharing this with us. I, I we've got a few ideas to take away from this, and I, hopefully it'll it'll lead to some additional talks uh, cool. in this area. Um, just, I mean, lots of great stuff you're doing. So I really appreciate it again coming out and allowing us to also to to publish this out to YouTube once I get it edited. Um, will help. You know, we can point people to this that missed it tonight and say, see, this, this is this is what we're trying to do. Um, and just help continue driving that conversation. And this is something we need for this region. So. Yeah, I really want Thanks. to show this to the, um, to the tech department head. And um, since we're starting the new CS or the cybersecurity um, degree and show them like what you guys are doing, because I um, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think that they have the um, the server room, which is incredibly important. Um, so yeah, I would like to show them. It, it takes a lot of work and dedication too. Uh, big advantage there is that both Chris and I come out of the data center production environment. So that helps as well. But otherwise, it's an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, absolutely. I'm more than willing to help as much as we can, right? Because part of our mission is to help it nationwide as well um, and try to help spur on that growth. Uh, so please feel free to reach out and, and talk and uh, please feel free to, we would love if you share your ideas and things that you're doing as well to help us improve, right? It's, it's a two way street. Exactly. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.